one uh, in the process is really driving interest. And really the key here is you can have a lead management system, you can have a marketing automation platform, you can have any tools out there. And unless you're really getting your sales channels, your external sales channels to be interested in what it is that you're providing them, you're generally not going to get accurate information back. And that's going to make it next to impossible to understand what's really happening with your marketing ROI and the effectiveness of your uh, sales cycle and your sales funnel. So ultimately the goal here is to drive interest among your sales channels, uh, getting them to be interested in both your lead management capabilities, nurturing capabilities, et cetera. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, CJ. Thinking about driving interest with a sales channel that you don't own, as would be the case with distributors, manufacturers, reps, partners, agents, is a difficult thing to do. And we could quantify this. In fact, if you look at what type of adoption companies are getting in their demand generation programs from channel partners, the numbers are staggeringly low. In fact, money doesn't seem to be a remedy either. If you think about the amount that manufacturers spend in marketing development funds, co-op funds, and related incentives, we've been able to track over $4 billion in unused MDF program dollars each year. So this is a staggering number. And when you think about it, what it really is telling us then is that most of the programs that are affected by this are the lead generating programs. They're either going to be the programs that are delivered by the manufacturer to the partner so that they could execute those with their customer and find new opportunities there. And also, so 85% of those programs are being affected and also the supplier to partner programs. So you can see by companies of different size, the numbers are still impactful. 35% of the marketing spend we see going to raising partner adoption and over a third of this amount is being impacted by partners simply not paying attention. And you know, if you ask yourself, why aren't partners engaging? Well, first of all, bandwidth is an issue. So you could look at their capacity to take the offer and execute is one way. But the other side of it is think about this. Those partners, on average, our data is showing balance six to seven vendor relationships. These are companies that sell, that manufacture products that they are selling, whether they're ancillary products to core vendors like yourselves or another line that they represent. Because of the sheer numbers of the, of the, of the different suppliers reaching out to them, we realize that this is causing them to take their eye off the ball and not give full participation in these efforts. What are the reasons for this lack of engagement? As I mentioned, too many vendors, too many initiatives. Sometimes the offer just doesn't resonate. It's not enough high value for that particular partner. Other times we've heard partners tell us it is so difficult to engage with that company on lead generating efforts, I'd rather they just keep their money and I'll do my own lead generation. So too difficult to engage becomes one of those things, such as the MDF process, Many times we also see suppliers putting the assets for the program on their website somewhere and the partners not being able to find it. So also the fact that they're not able to find what they need when they need it contributes to this lack of engagement. Now finally, we must realize that the supplier's marketing capabilities are different than the vendor's or the manufacturer's marketing capabilities. And one of the things to think about there is that if you own the marketing asset repositories or you have the marketing asset, uh, the marketing uh, automation platforms, then it's really in the driver's seat to help those partners understand how they need to go ahead and use them because they lack that technology. Now, CJ, I understand you might have an example that you could share with us. Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to put together a couple of case studies to back up each of these key points. And so the challenge in this particular uh, case study, we had a client, they had roughly 15,000 leads a year coming in annually, uh, and they were not initially being uh, ranked. And of course then the result is the wrong leads were being sent uh, to the wrong salespeople. What we found was that at a base, uh, the regional sales lead follow-up was less than 50%. The solution we put in place 
first we clearly defined uh, criteria for qualifying the leads and we got agreement between uh, sales and marketing to do that. We then reprioritized the lead ranking criteria such that we were only sending the hottest leads uh, to the sales channel. And that really dealt with what Laz was talking about in regards to uh, time management uh, among vendors. Then we standardized the qualification questions, which really simplified the amount of knowledge that uh, each individual salesperson had to retain regarding each individual uh, marketing campaign that was being done. And then finally, we implemented a nurturing program through our in-house uh, call center on behalf of uh, that client so that as warm leads were coming in, we were actually helping uh, to call in on those leads, and then we were also reminding uh, the actual sales channels uh, of new leads and how to work through those leads from a training perspective. The results, well, we were able to double the reported uh, company sales conversions. So uh, we actually in increased by 100% the number of sales that were being reported in the, in the lead management system. The sales cycle itself was reduced by 20%. Regionally, the leads uh, were actually, the, the follow-up on the leads was actually maximized at 92%, which was a, just a drastic increase over what the client was seeing before. And so it really shows in this, in this uh, simple example how you can take and make a few minor changes, uh, including your uh, lead management, your nurturing capabilities, uh, integrate those things together, make things simpler for your sales channels, and you will really start to see that they begin to value uh, the leads, and as a result, they start actually reporting more uh, on those leads, uh, giving the, the client, uh, giving yourself the ability to take more actionable uh, steps to, to improve your marketing results. So we wanted to talk about step two, uh, the importance of capturing uh, information. Uh, in this step, you know, we're really talking about a couple of things. One thing that you'll want to consider is optimizing your forms to gain maximum information, but you'll want to be really careful that you're not doing that in such a way that you're driving your audience away. So being careful not to ask too many BANT questions or ask too many questions total, those types of things. You really have to kind of play with your forms very, very carefully there. But you also want to make sure that you don't ask for such a little amount of data that you're not providing uh, good leads or good qualified information back to your sales department. And so it's really an, a really uh, cautious kind of 50-50 split between how much you're asking for, uh, what you're capturing, and what you're sending to uh, your sales channels. Thanks, EJ. You bring up some pretty important points here. Um, capturing the data is critical. And sometimes the data isn't captured in its entirety, or sometimes some of the data is left behind. What we've done is we've reached out to various partners and distributors. Um, we've talked to outsource vendors that are used for some of the some of the lead generation and um, also looked at you know the the partners and the suppliers themselves and here's the feedback that they share with us the first thing they say is you know bad data undefined service level agreements lack of underlying infrastructure are all contributing to poor lead management on behalf of the partner but sometimes the data doesn't get passed or captured in a way that it's useful to the partner so many times the feedback from the partner is Hey, by the time we get in touch with the customer, too much time has elapsed and the lead becomes cold. So one of the lessons learned here is to really make sure that you treat that lead with its importance and pass it over to the partner when necessary based on service level agreements. A lot of outsource vendors, companies that you work with that are helping you drive the lead effort, sometimes the information that you're asking them about the lead is uh, minimal compared to the amount of information they're capturing up front. So we hear from the outsource vendors, hey, we're collecting a lot of information about the customer's environment and mapping accounts as we develop the leads, but we're being asked to upload this lead data into a management system, and a lot of the data is lost, becomes unusable by the, by the customer. So that's something to bear in mind. And really from the partner side of it, CJ, one of the things here is partners are very used to these one-off efforts. It almost we call them drive-by marketing activities. And, and it seems to the partner that each one of their suppliers tends to check off a list and say, all right, I've generated lead for that distributor. Let me leave them alone for a while. And from the partner perspective, we don't, they don't get to see the connection between the campaign and the lead that results from the campaign or a steady cadence of leads moving from the campaign to them. So either too little in terms of volumes, too much, or not enough 
to capture the information that you need is creating, I would say, some, some negative uh, feedback from the partner indicating that, hey, we could do a better job at this. So, CJ, maybe you have an example that uh, you can share with the group on, um, on capturing this data a little bit better. Absolutely. So let's look at the next case study. Uh, so the challenge in this case, uh, this particular client had 15% of leads uh, being generated, which were qualified leads. And I should I should clarify what we mean there because uh, Laz will actually get into this in just a few other a few more slides. But we've defined a lead as something that is actually sales qualified. So they have accepted the lead in this case as a sales department from marketing, and they agree that they are going to pursue that that lead. And 15% of the leads that were generated by marketing were showing up as being sales qualified at that level. So sales channels were reporting in this case when leads were bad, um, but they were not reporting when leads were good. And what we were finding was that they were more frustrated uh, than they were pleased with how their lead management was, was working at that time. So the company set a goal with us uh, and asked us if we could increase their percentage of qualified leads uh, to 25% within a 12-month period, and we accepted that challenge. So the solution. Uh, we developed a new process for qualification and for ranking. Uh, so a new process, new algorithm, the whole thing was redone uh, from scratch. We improved the inquiry data capture for inbound calls and trade shows, and what we found was there was a lack of consistency in the questions being asked, which made it very difficult to rank accurately, and then the leads were being distributed uh, inappropriately as a result. Then we introduced a structured lead nurturing program using integrated marketing techniques. And so what we would do as an example is take someone who came in as a cold lead and put them into an e-nurturing um, campaign. But somebody who came in as a warm lead might get a direct phone uh, conversation from our contact center. But somebody that was a hot lead would be sent directly to the sales department to be followed up on. And as each of those channels were uh, progressing that lead through the sales channel, we would adjust how that person was being nurtured accordingly. So the overall results that we found, we were able to increase qualified leads by 60%, uh, actually exceeding the client specific goal. Uh, we increased trade show leads uh, for them from 11% to 18%. We increased their webinar registrations from 10% uh, to 60%. We increased telephone qualification results from 22% to 58%, and we were really, really pleased uh, with these results. And, you, and you're probably starting to see a pattern that by stepping in and implementing a solid uh, lead management system and then uh, applying some specific structure, you both simplify the process for uh, your sales channels and you allow them to see that there is a significant amount of value that they find by using that lead management system. Uh, and then the end result is a great level of uh, turnover from inquiry to sale. So let's talk about the next step in the process. Um, step three, differentiating between um, good and bad leads. And so what we're really talking about here is we've reached that point where we've captured good information. Uh, we know we've got our forms and we've got things consistent. And what we really need to do at this point is say, A, is that lead actually a quality lead based on my particular business rules? And B, if it is a quality lead, how valuable is it? And what do I want to do with it as a result of that particular value? And, and what we're finding now is that marketers have to kind of change their mindset. Uh, marketing departments used to be all about just generating X number of leads and sending those to sales, and then their job was done. And now marketers are being asked to continuously push those particular leads through the sales cycle. And so we have to do a better job from a marketing standpoint of uh, being sales facilitators and helping them move those leads uh, through the funnel. And that, that is a super important thing moving forward is both providing a, a good number of leads, but also providing a solid number of highly ranked leads for sales to follow up with and helping them find who those solid leads are. If you're out there thinking to yourselves, well, how do I differentiate between these leads? I think that the first premise that you have to go by is that not all leads are created equally. In fact, the better job you can do at defining the different types of leads to your partner before you pass them to them and let them know what to expect or what to do next, the better response you'll get from your partners. What we're doing here is 
talking about defining those leads. And, and I'd like to introduce to you the Serious Decisions Demand Waterfall, which looks at leads differently. It differentiates leads based on five distinct stages. And let me quickly walk you through what these stages are. The first stage is the inquiry stage. And in the inquiry stage, we're just really talking about hand raisers here. These are folks that have made a response to a form on a website, um, re responded to an outbound call or some interest that was generated. And we don't really have any qualification yet unless there's a systematic qualification on the lead. So at the inquiry stage, we need to look at what exactly generated the offer. And then as a service level, is we look at the next stage, which is the marketing qualified lead. At the marketing qualified lead, the lead now has been qualified by a teleservices or a telemarketing function. And basically what we're looking for is two out of four band criteria. Number one, that we're talking to the right person, so we've got the authority. And number two, that there's a genuine need here. And only when we have those two criteria met do we go to the third stage, which is called the sales accepted stage. Now, in channel marketing, the sales accepted stage is generally when the partner receives the lead and agrees to register it in your deal registration system. So this is a, a physical acknowledgement that the lead has been received and that sales agrees to work on the lead. Nothing more than that. We just want to know that the receiving function has gotten it and is now moving forward with it. When they contact the customer and they further qualify them, maybe by phone or through an on-site visit, we now call that a sales qualified lead. And when it's a sales qualified lead, we expect that lead to now show up in the pipeline. So it's now flipped or switched or whatever you do within your system to call it now an opportunity. So now we talk about sales qualified leads and opportunities in the pipeline and ultimately the fish stage is the close slash one business stage. This is when the opportunity either closes or is entered into the recycling program to nurture that lead further on. Now why is this important? What can I say or what can I do to share with you how important this is? Well, let's look at some numbers. Here is the demand waterfall and we're going to compare three types of organizations. Organizations that have average performance in their turnover and leads, companies that have strong processes, some service level agreements, and then best practice organizations. And what we'll do is we'll look at the conversion of these leads from each stage. So for example, the conversion rate from inquiry to marketing qualified lead for average companies is 3.9%. Now, when you compare that with companies that have best practices, that is to say that they can root leads directly from their website into the hands of the telemarketer for further qualification, you can see that they outperform average companies by a factor of 3x. At the next stage, when we talk about marketing qualified lead to sales accepted lead, here the numbers are not as big in terms of differences, but you do see that the handoffs are important. So whereas an average company can convert 58.3% of those leads, companies with best practices at this stage, almost 75% or three quarters of those leads are converted. At the, fourth, at the third stage now, the key conversion rate between marketing qualified, and now this is a teleservices function, passing the lead on to the partner and expecting that partner to acknowledge they've received it and registered it. At this stage, we can see that poor performing companies or those that are average will do about 49% conversion, whereas now companies with best practices can do about 60.5%. Now, to offer a little bit of insight on what makes these companies best practice companies, here again, service level agreements play or factor heavily. In other words, the partner knows that they may have 24 hours to register that lead before it gets deposited into what we call a shark tank, for example. So again, service level agreements factor heavily here. And then finally, we're at that last stage when we're talking about the sales qualified lead to close. Now I will say, this is the black hole of channel marketing. At this point, you're lucky if you know what's going on, if you have the systems in place, and with a system like uh, SmartLead, you actually can have this visibility because now you can track 
those registered deals into actual opportunities. And you can see that there is a variance, not as much as earlier on at the top of the funnel, but here the selling process becomes more difficult. So we expect the supplier to be working hand in hand in some cases with the partner, and you can see the conversion rates between average and best practices varies from 23.1% to 30%. So you can see there is a difference here, but to further quantify the point, let's say that you started with a thousand leads at the top. If you were average, you would have only been able to convert one closed opportunity. If you were strong process, you can close three opportunities. And then finally, if you're best practice, you can close six opportunities. So I don't know, CJ, what do you think? Would you like to be number one, number three, or number six? Which one makes the most sense? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, obviously, generally, I would want to be on, on the upper end. That would certainly make my CEO happier. <laughs> so we wanted to look at a couple of things that you can do, a couple of ideas, simple ideas to do to uh, better qualify uh, throughout the process. And we wanted to give you a couple of simple uh, examples, things that you might look at, types of questions that you might try to drive towards. And it's important that you not just look at this list and just take the entire list and convert that into uh, you know, some updated forms, but that you're looking at this from a statistical modeling standpoint and understanding if, if a particular prospect is within an income range, do I have a higher propensity for them to purchase? Or are they from a particular uh, piece of demographic data that's going to make that indication? Um, so what is it that we're using to qualify? And these are a couple of uh, simple examples that you might use. And generally, you'll use some combination of, of things like this. Uh, it could be you know, time to make a decision. It could be the, the person's particular title or their uh, particular power to make that decision. Uh, but it could be things like uh, income range or size of company, things like that. Then you need to actually start thinking about how to rank. So you, you will have determined at that point how to qualify a specific lead. And then the next step is, well, how do we determine how valuable uh, that is? And really the, the best way to do that is to look at all of your data points, perform some uh, statistical analysis if you have not done that before, um, and then kind of look at, well, is there particular points of contact information? Maybe it's title where I can see uh, how strong that lead would be ranked, or maybe it's how they answered a specific question uh, in my Q&A set. Um, it could be that you find that there's a really high propensity to purchase if someone shows an interest in a particular product. Uh, and we've also seen examples where uh, specific events are held. So it could be a trade show um, that you're doing where you're asking basically the same questions, but because you know your event source is uh, trade show A versus trade show B, uh, those leads may be ranked higher. You know that people have a higher tendency to purchase, that you have a, a closer relationship with your uh, demographic audience uh, based in that particular um, trade show. So ultimately what you're trying to do is look at the specific data points that you're capturing, uh, and they're very similar to what you're using to qualify, but now you're using those points to determine what the actual propensity uh, to purchase is and then ranking accordingly uh, before you decide what it is that you're going to send to your uh, sales department. So that takes us into step four uh, in the funnel. And in step four, we're really looking at lead nurturing, uh, which plays a large role in the overall marketing function, but it also plays a really important and often uh, unfortunately overlooked role as it relates to your sales channel. Uh, so when you think about nurturing, um, Laz mentioned early on that you can expect your sales channels not to be quite as advanced in terms of how they are going to market. And one of the best ways to help them understand the value of uh, your lead management efforts is to help them nurture as a result of using those lead management efforts. So what do I mean by that? An example may be that if your, uh, if your sales channel goes in and they modify a particular lead and they say, well, I did actually call this person and we've touched base and we're going to do a follow-up, maybe you automatically enter that person into a nurturing campaign where they're going to receive uh, one email every week for the next five weeks uh, until the point of the actual call. And then that, what you're doing then is keeping your brand in that person's mind until the point of call, which is going to assist your salesperson. They're going to start to see uh, their sales numbers go on the rise as a result of just uh, clicking a specific checkbox, and you're going to get really good, accurate information related to how your nurturing campaigns are working uh, towards driving that sales funnel. And this is what we see pretty consistently being one of the key drivers towards reducing the sales cycle 
uh, time. Everybody wants to shorten that sales cycle, CJ. Um, some of you are probably sitting out there thinking to yourself, well, what's the right tactic that I should use to nurture these leads? And really, the answer isn't one tactic over another. It really depends on the customer. So, for example, the program mix, that is the collection of marketing tactics and the strategy that you employ to reach those customers, is going to vary by customer segment. So here what we have is a look at four customer segments, the enterprise, the name commercial, the general territory, and small to business, small to mid-sized businesses, also known as small to mid-sized enterprises. What we can see right off the, the top from a strategic perspective is that enterprise and name commercial companies, they tend to favor more uh, relationship marketing, and you actually see some of the data uh, collection exercise being very important here, mapping large accounts, being able to understand what's going on there. Um, from the So comparing that to a general territory or the small to mid-sized enterprise, there you're going to rely more on demand generation tactics, uh, inbound marketing, for example, to raise awareness, to impart thought leadership. Those are going to be critically important. In other words, helping your dealers and your partners cast a wide net through demand creation and digital marketing to nurture those leads and to capture them in the first place. That being said, you should notice that not only is the strategy different in the small to mid-sized enterprise versus the enterprise market, um, also the mix is different. So you can see that while email kind of works the same on both, web and internet definitely have an impact or a greater impact in the smaller size markets. And why is that? We find that a lot of times organizations in these small companies are doing their homework online to really find out who's out there, who are the thought leaders, who should we form opinion, opinions around. From that perspective, both phone and direct mail still play an important part, but it's really that internet dynamic, CJ, that makes a difference here. And if we drill down one level further, we can now blow this out into a program mix. And for those of you who are trying to reach small to mid-sized enterprise customers, what we thought is we'd share with you what the program mix is for this segment. And you can see, again, we've got web and banner advertising and webcasts and webinars like the ones we're having here having a, a significant effect. That doesn't mean that live events are going to go away or trade shows. We still see those as being very important, but not as much as the digital type um, of program that is driving some of the early stage leads. From that perspective, email has its play, but it doesn't necessarily play along the, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the buyer's journey. We find email might be great for capturing some interest, but over time it wanes, and, and a lot of you probably know this already. More emails you send, the less act, uh, active that customer will be in responding to you. And then ultimately, some of the other things that are used are downloadable trials, demos, association marketing, maybe white papers that impart thought leadership. Those are also going to be important. So I think the, the takeaway here, CJ, is that not all leads, again, are created equal, and depending on the customer, you need to form a strategy around that customer and then ultimately drill down to the right program because, again, not all leads should be nurtured the same way either. So let's talk a little bit about the role of electronic fulfillment and the contact center in light of this different program mix, and I'll pass it back over to CJ. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. I think you really start to see the value of your lead management efforts when you start to look at different uh, marketing tactics and touch points that you're utilizing. And you'll see a drastic increase across the value of each of your marketing efforts when you start to integrate those services together. And so often what we recommend is to actually start to utilize um, each of your systems, but to have each of your systems, whether it be electronic fulfillment or the contact center or uh, maybe your physical fulfillment efforts, have each of those things integrate back into uh, your lead management system and allow your lead management system to be a central database of record. And so what you end up with is having the ability to have what happens in your electronic fulfillment affect what happens in your contact center or having your contact center affect what happens in your physical fulfillment. So we'll walk through and show you some examples of, of how that works. So in relation to electronic fulfillment, here's what we're talking about. Obviously emails. 
but maybe somebody uh, wants to view a specific brochure. And so you capture some information, you show that person the brochure, and then you also send that person uh, that specific brochure via email so they have that uh, for their records later. Maybe it's an ebook, maybe it's a link to a webinar, uh, could be a webcast. And all of these things are great. And doing these things are great, and you're certainly going to have value just because you're sending out these emails on top of uh, the person making a specific information request. Imagine, though, if you were capturing the results of those emails and tying that back into uh, your, your lead management for your sales channels. So what could end up happening here? Let me give you an example. An example would be that someone requests information, and as a result, you enter them into a nurturing campaign, and you send out five emails over the course of five weeks. And your sales channel is actually seeing on the fly with each of their leads what's happening uh, as a result of those emails being sent out. So they know um, that their particular lead received those five emails and they opened four of them. So right away, uh, I would know as a salesperson, this person enjoys being communicated with via email. They're actually taking the time to at least open those emails. I can continue to communicate with them in that way. Or maybe they're not opening those emails and I want to try something different, maybe perhaps just a direct phone call uh, in that case. Maybe beyond that, though, wouldn't it be powerful if you could track actual activity within the email? So now let's say that the same lead opens those four emails and they click on uh, one link in each email, uh, which actually distributes across two different products of interest. And so now you're actually sharing that information that that user had clicked on those links in that email, and you're sharing that out to your sales team uh, so that when they go to actually look at the lead before they contact them, they already know this guy has opened the email four times. And by the way, they're interested in these two specific products. You might as well go ahead and start focusing on that because that's what they want to talk about. And that's another key way that you can drastically shorten your sales cycle and show value to your sales channel in relation to your lead management and marketing efforts. As it pertains to um, the contact center. So if you're utilizing a contact center, you may be utilizing that plus your email, but you may be use a lot, utilizing the contact center solely. So maybe you believe that your particular target audience prefers to be contacted via the contact center, and that's great. One of the key problems that we find is that um, third-party contact centers are often utilized or internal uh, contact centers are utilized, but those systems, for whatever reason, are not being integrated back into the actual lead records. Uh, and as a result, what happens in the communication is maybe shared via an Excel file or a database file of some sort, but it's not actually being tracked as a result of the overall marketing efforts, and you don't really see what was it that was pushing this person through my sales cycle. You don't have the ability to re-rank your lead and then adjust how you're communicating, or what if the contact center happens to reach a person and they know that that person is no longer a warm lead, but they're now a hot lead, and they need to get that lead out to your sales channel. Well, if you're not integrating those things, then they could send maybe an email directly to your sales channel, but now your sales channel is interacting with that particular lead outside of your lead management system, and you lose the ability to track what's happening in your marketing altogether. So we see this happening all of the time. As a result, if you integrate those systems together, you have the ability to also adjust your nurturing. So you can say, based on the responses from this call, I want to adjust what it is that we're sending out. Maybe they're now a more valuable lead and I want to send out a physical mail package. Maybe they're a less valuable lead and I want to stop sending out that mail package. And so you're, you're both saving money and in increasing your marketing ROI as a result of getting that data back um, from your contact center. And I know Laz has a little bit more information to talk about specific to telequalification and teleservices. Yeah, CJ, I think the, you know, I appreciate the fact that I can interject one point here before you move on to the different types of uh, communication that works together. I would say that teleservices can make all the difference. And, and for those of you who are suffering from visibility into lead progress, I think one of the things that you should be aware of is that there is no technology magic wand that you can wave to give you better visibility into leads. And we find that the basic blocking and tackling performed by teleservices, that is, to reach out and call partners and talk to them about, you know, what the implementation of the play is that's generating the lead, how long will it take, uh, what kind of marketing support they have at their disposal, and also letting them know where and when to update leads 
and knowing that, hey, you know, you may be receiving a call from me to maybe look into the progress of these leads. This is going to be critically important in being able to go back in there and get that closed loop visibility. So one of the things that we like to tell, tell our clients is, you know, yes, you can use systems to give you better visibility to a certain extent. But at the end of the day, if you really want to know what's happening with that lead, you can employ your contact center to just reach out to the partners in a continuous basis, not you know when you need the information, but throughout the, the creation of the demand and through the program itself, you can have them uh, talk to them about updating the leads in the lead portal, giving them maybe biweekly reporting and play management, here's what you need to do next. And I think that what we're seeing is a lot of organizations creating these concierge-like services to complement the workflows and the scoring and all the other things that the lead management systems bring to bear. So I wanted to make this point before we go on and start advancing the conversation into different types of, of leads and, and how they all work together and just reiterate that teleservices beyond the contact center could do a lot in giving you the visibility, CJ. So thanks a lot. Appreciate me getting that word in. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so the last point that I wanted to look at is maybe what you're doing is actually um, nurturing your leads through some form of direct mail. Maybe you have a tchotchke that you've developed that you want to send out or a physical, physical fulfillment packet of uh, specific brochures and uh, information related to your products. And so what can you get as a result of nurturing uh, in this way? And this one is a little trickier, but there are some ways that you can do this. So one of the things you can do is make sure that any pieces that you're sending out, any physical mail pieces, have some sort of unique identifier in the URL. Um, and that allows you to track, did this particular brochure or this particular postcard or this particular fill in the blank uh, actually send someone back to my site? And I generally recommend to our clients that if you're going to do that, build a specific landing page related to uh, the material that you've sent that person. And potentially even at this stage, ask for a little bit of additional information related to that prospect. You can append that information back into the lead and you'll be able to track which piece was actually uh, generating that additional information, that additional drive. You can use that to make a lot of decisions in terms of future printing costs uh, when you're building out your budget um, for the next year. And as you're doing that, now you have the ability to say, okay, well, again, this person gave me a little bit more information. Maybe they're no longer a warm lead. Maybe they're a hot lead, and I want to adjust what I'm doing with them. And if they're a hot lead, I'm going to send them directly to my sales channel, and I'm going to let them know they have a hot lead to be followed up on. Or maybe I send them to the contact center um, just to be verified at that point or to have an appointment scheduled, whatever the case may be. And so it's really important to really consider each of your particular sales channels and how those could potentially be integrated back into um, your central database of record, how you're going to utilize that for your lead management efforts, and then how that can both help your sales channel understand more about their particular prospect and how it helps you understand more about your overall marketing ROI. And so we've talked about this, and I, and I won't beat a dead horse, uh, so to speak, but really making sure that you're considering every piece of this puzzle and not just getting one piece or another piece to integrate into your lead management system, but allowing that lead management system to integrate back out. And so what you really want to do is allow your prospect to tell you, I am interested in whatever it is they're interested in, and have your system automate as much as possible the ability to nurture them through the process that they're interested in. So you might start out just knowing they are interested in your company, and they fill out a form and they tell you that. And you might integrate that with your contact center where you find out more that they're interested in a specific product. And at that point, you want your email marketing automation platform to automatically start sending them some information about that product. And as they show an interest in that specific product, uh, or maybe even provide you additional information as a result, you might want to send that to uh, your sales team so that they are automatically contacting that person and following up. And so it really is allowing all of these different tools that you've got at your disposal to work together to change what message you're sending to that prospect based on what they're telling you their interest in. And that is going to drastically reduce your overall uh, sales cycle. So we wanted to look at a specific uh, case study. And in this case, here was the challenge. Each year, 
um, we had a company that was fielding 100,000 inquiries. And the company's average sale was about $5,000, or $5,000, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what we d did was design a series of tests to, to determine how many touch points should we actually implement for this client to maximize their ROI? Is there a point of diminishing return? I'm sure many people have this, this same question. So we started with a particular pool of the leads, and we said, well, what happens if there's absolutely no nurturing? And of course, this was a pretty small pool, but what we found was an average conversion rate of 2.16%, which really was not terrible. Then we looked at, well, what if we sent out just one touch point? And that actually raised the conversion rate to 2.86%, which was actually a 32.4% increase over no nurturing at all. And when you're talking about 100,000 inquiries and $5,000 per sale, that amount, even though that's a small percentage overall, adds up to a lot of dollars for that business. So then we looked at two and three touches. And at two touches, we actually saw a 3.33% conversion rate, and so that was a 16.6% .6 conversion over the previous. At three touches, however, we really did start to see a point of diminishing returns, um, and so they had barely a, a hundredth of a percent um, increase from 3.33 to 3.34. And I want to be really cautious here that, that the audience is recognizing this was for one specific client. This will not be the case for, for all clients, and in this specific client's case, what we found is if you do four and five touches, you actually did reach that point of diminishing returns. In most cases, what we have found for clients is that it actually can take anywhere between six, seven, eight touches. For this particular client, they had a, a really well-established brand recognition. And so the between one and three touches was really reminding that user that they had requested some information and allowing them an additional opportunity to reach out to the salesperson. After that, we, what we pretty much found was they were either going to buy or they very likely were not going to buy. And so you started reaching that point of diminishing returns quicker uh, than you would have otherwise. So just be cautious that you don't look at this specific case study and immediately apply that to your marketing department and tell them you have to only do three touch points because we'll lose diminishing returns because that will not necessarily be the case for you. It was just the case in this particular study. But you can really see how by integrating uh, all of this information into the lead management system, we had the resources, we had the tools to be able to say and run this study to show what were our specific returns if we develop different, uh, different marketing touch points or different levels of touch points. And so with that, I'm going to start talking about the lead distribution, step five of the process. Um, and lead distribution is drastically important you know, it's great that you can rank and it's great that you can qualify, it's great that you can nurture, but if you don't distribute those leads accurately to the right person at the right time, it's really generally useless. And so I'm going to let Laz talk a little bit about those lead distribution issues. Thanks, EJ. Um, when it comes to lead dis distribution, a lot of our clients um, really try to put their arms around what are the issues that they need to solve for. And so we thought that during the course of this webcast today, we would give you the top uh, issues that you need to solve for. And so the first one is, uh, what are the rules for assignment? So how are the leads going to be assigned amongst the different types of partners? You may want to assign certain leads to partners who have made greater commitments in your program. Um, they may be the gold or platinum partners within your program, and you might want to assign it based on that. You might, might want to assign it based on product lines that they carry or even geographies that they serve or customer segments. The next thing is how to register, approve, and decline leads. Let me start by saying that it's okay to say to a partner, we will accept that lead. What's not okay is not to tell them why. So as long as you're predictable and you can share with the particular partner why a lead has been approved or not approved, that's going to be critically important. Also, what are the ground rules for managing channel conflict? Inevitably, as you distribute leads to your channel partners, you will deal with the issue that some partners are calling on the same lead. And again, transparency is really the rule of thumb here. To be able to stand up and say, the reason we are uh, mitigating this in favor of partner A over partner B 
is, for example, that the lead was registered earlier or um, there was an existing relationship there before the second partner reached out to the lead. That's okay, and a lot of companies use what's called a reseller protection on the account. And it's, it's okay to do that, but what's not okay, again, is not to be predictable. So if partners understand that you're doing this for their own benefit, and if you say no to them, that you may say no to another partner who's trying to register their lead, that's going to be the kind of predictability that they're looking for. Uh, one other issue is how long should you keep leads in the system? Now, you know, there's the, uh, the anecdote story that I always hear is, you know, my brother-in-law works for Exxon, and while I'm not really calling on Exxon right now, down in the future sometime I will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to register a lead for Ex Exxon under my brother-in-law's uh, email address, hoping that one day he's going to come over for a cup of coffee and we're going to sell him something. Well, the truth of the matter is we call that deal squatting or lead squatting. And as an organization, you need to determine how long will you keep these leads under a registered partner when there's no activity. So what you want to make sure is that you have some policies in place to care, take care of this, whether it's 30 days, 60 day, 90 day. And what I would advise you is look at your sales cycles. If, it's, uh, if you've got a 90 day sales cycle and you're getting into the second month and you haven't seen an update on that lead, chances are that the partner is squatting on that lead, either because some future purchase might happen or simply because they want to make sure that nobody else calls on that account. So you've got to keep your eyes open about that one. Uh, ultimately, we shared some insights into how to close the loop with the leads. And again, teleservices plays a big uh, role in that. And then finally, once you've got all this down, how are you going to govern the process? So are you going to go back to your sales and marketing quarterly reviews and use that as an opportunity to share what the policies and procedures are? Or are you going to hard code them into letters of understanding or contracts that you might be using and sharing with the customer to govern the process as well? So between the vendor and the partner, there's a lot of opportunity to trip over, trip over yourselves. And so what we've done here is shared with you the main issues that you need to solve for. And CJ, I'll pass it back to you so that you can go a little bit further into lead distribution and how our listeners can address the, the different distribution aspects. Sounds great. Thank you very much. So we wanted to give you just a quick example of lead distribution, knowing that we're running close to the end of time here wanted to give you a couple of ideas of different things you might look at that will determine how you distribute your leads. So you might distribute by vertical or geographic region, specific qualification or rank, specific source or event, or some sort of customizable um, data point. And you don't have to just use one of those elements, but we do see quite often if someone's just using like an Excel spreadsheet or their email system to try to distribute their leads, that they tend to look at just one specific metric and that doesn't give you the whole picture. So we wanted to give you an example of what a truly advanced uh, distribution might look like. Um, so first you might want to identify the specific product type. Um, if not all of your sales channel deals with that product type, you don't want to distribute that lead to them. And then you might look by geography. So if someone's in a specific zip code and there's a sales uh, person in their area, you may want to send the lead to them. So Chicago in this example. Uh, you have to identify the rank to make sure that you're only sending the hottest leads um, to that salesperson. If they're hot, you want to send it out. If they're warm, you can nurture. If they're cold, don't send it out at all. Uh, and then uh, you, you really limit how much you're asking your sales department to focus on those, those leads that are not going to be ranked well. Identifying dealer tier is extremely valuable. So what you might do is say, my top tier, those guys that are most likely to make a sale, I'm going to call them, quote, unquote, the gold tier, and I'm going to send them five times the leads. Uh, and the silver guys, I'm going to say, they're fairly likely to make a sale, so I'm going to send them two times the leads. And my bronze are brand new. They don't really know a lot about my product yet. I'm going to send them one lead for every five of the gold dealer. And by putting all of these things together, you really maximize uh, the overall value uh, of your lead distribution system. Um, and so I am going to move us ahead and talk a little bit about the follow-up um, there's a couple of different approaches you can use to maximizing follow-up uh, with your particular audience. One we call the carrot approach. Uh, with the carrot approach, you're really making an effort to make your sales team feel supported, um, and, and the goal is to get them to be more likely to report accurately on their leads. And some ways to do that, we've talked a little bit already. You can offer to nurture 
Uh, you can offer additional programs. If you go into the lead management system and you mark your lead in such a way, we are going to provide our contact center to help support you or some direct mail or uh, we will do additional training for you. Um, we will provide you with additional resources or even additional MDF funds. It just depends on what it is you want to offer. But you really want to make them feel like your goal is to support them, and there's a number of ways you can do that uh, within your, your lead management uh, capabilities. The opposite of that is kind of the stick approach. And largely what you do in that case is you are reassign the lead if there's a certain level of activity. And so you tell the person, your, your particular sales channel, hey, I really want to support you. We are going to give you a defined service level agreement, a defined number of days or whatever the case may be, where you will follow up on this lead. And if you don't follow up on the lead, given all the support that we're giving you, we're eventually just going to reassign that and put that as Laz mentioned, maybe into a shark tank or just reassign it to the next um, most likely um, sales channel candidate. And so we wanted to look at a specific challenge, specific case study. Um, and in this case, we were trying to identify were the leads actually sold uh, for this client. And starting out, the client had some flawed logic in their old system. It led to a low lead confidence by sales. The wrong leads were going to the wrong people. And mostly the result of that was because there was no pre-qualification. So the solution we implemented, our contact center followed up with each dealer and we made sure that they had the training that they needed and the knowledge level to utilize the system. We then encouraged the dealers to actually uh, provide results from their sales and we did that through um, some different nurturing opportunities. Uh, the leads were finally redistributed if they weren't followed up on. The results, well, we actually increased the dealer compliance by 122%. Uh, the reported sales conversion rates were increased by 48%. And the manufacturer ultimately was able to fine-tune their television advertising efforts within the same number of overall marketing dollars. Um, so they were able to take the actual accurately reported data and realize that there were some opportunities to maximize uh, their marketing efforts within the same spend, which led to more leads, and then the, the cycle just kind of kept building up on itself. And with that, we are at the end. We've gone through all six stages of the lead life cycle uh, for your sales channel. We've got a couple of minutes for some questions, and let's see what we've got. Um, are there cases where the first person to the prospect wins. Well, yeah, there, there absolutely are. I've been in those cases myself where uh, I reach out to a number of vendors and the first one to contact me ends up being the winner because I have a, a high likelihood I feel comfortable with them as a professional sales team. Laz, have you seen um, any specific studies showing uh, the likelihood of first contact uh, being the, the winner of, of the sale? Well, not necessarily specific studies, but I can tell you that uh, the concept of protecting the deal for the first reseller that reaches the lead has always been a constant in channel programs. So I think that's a hard, fast rule. You know, first one to the table wins the meal, and I think that using things like reseller protection to, you know, enforce that is something that's commonplace across the board. Yeah. Um, another question, if I can do only one thing – what should I do? And, and of course, that depends on what you're doing right now. Um, but largely, I would say anything that you can do um, to, first of all, make sure that you are ranking, qualifying, and distributing your leads um, accurately is going to be a huge first step. If you're already doing that, um, and, and generally you'll do that through your, your lead management service, if you're already doing that, then going to the next step and integrating your different nurturing platforms into that is going to be really take you into that next level where you can track what's happening uh, and really make some, some better decisions over time. Uh, and so that actually reaches the, the end of our time. I would really like to thank everyone so much for attending this. We will be, uh, we've recorded this session. We'll be cleaning that up and sending out a link within the next 24 hours uh, for everyone to be able to share with uh, your specific uh, coworkers or anyone else that you may want to share this information with. So on behalf of Smart Lead and Serious Decisions, thank you so much for attending. Bye-bye.